I'm Darius Spearman, and you're watching African Elements. When speaking of the Black Panther Party, black leather jackets, berets, and guns often come to mind. However, the Black Panther Party was much more than that. In this video, I explore some of the lesser known aspects of the Black Panther Party, its revolutionary ideology, and the vulnerabilities that led to the organization's demise. All that coming up next. Thank you for watching African Elements. If you're new to this channel, we produce content in Black and Africana studies and bring it right here where the people are at. Check out our webpage, AfricanElements.org, for educational resources and news articles updated daily. If you'd like to see more of this content, be sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe. That said, let's dive in. In October 1966, six black men, Huey Newton, Bobby Seale, Albert Big Man Howard, Sherwin Fort, Reggie Fort, and Little Bobby Hutton founded the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. They founded the organization on principles of revolutionary black nationalism. To understand what that means, it is essential to first explore what black nationalism is. Black nationalism is an ideology that promotes racial solidarity among black people and advocates for self-determination and political power within the United States. In its simplest form, black nationalism is the recognition of cultural and racial commonality and a call to racial solidarity. The political objectives of black nationalism can range from the admonition that black people must control the politics and economics of their communities to the creation of a separate black nation in North America or returning to the African homeland. The many expressions of black nationalism include cultural black nationalism, which celebrates the African origins of black culture, and emigrationism, which emphasizes a physical return to the continent of Africa. As a revolutionary black nationalist organization, the Black Panther Party embraced anti-colonialism and saw themselves as part of the global movement against colonization, racism, and capitalism. They believed that Africa and all colonized people had a right to self-determination and embraced Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism is a worldview that advocates for global solidarity amongst black people throughout the global diaspora. The Black Panther Party saw themselves in kinship with colonized people worldwide who were oppressed and exploited economically and politically. Like colonized people, the Black Panthers saw the police as a colonial occupying force and as agents of their economic and political oppression. The Black Panther Party gained much inspiration from Malcolm X, who in turn gained much of his influence from Marcus Garvey. Nevertheless, the Black Panthers departed from both Malcolm X and Marcus Garvey, who tended to emphasize the development of black businesses and entrepreneurship as the path to prosperity in the black community. Instead, the Black Panthers embraced revolutionary black nationalism, which heavily emphasized collectivism and people power to meet the community's needs. Revolutionary black nationalism is an ideology that combines elements of both black power and revolutionary socialism. Revolutionary nationalists maintain that African Americans cannot achieve liberation in the United States within the existing political and economic system. Therefore, they call for revolution to rid society of capitalism, imperialism, racism, and sexism. The Black Panther Party required of its members an astute understanding of revolutionary theory and practice. Weekly mandatory political education included readings from Franz Fanon, Paulo Freire, Ernesto Che Guevara, Karl Marx, and Mao Te Tung's Little Red Book. Putting theory into practice, the Black Panther Party had dozens of community programs ranging from the Breakfast for Children program to community health clinics, all free to community members. The Black Panther Party's 10-point program, first publicized in May of 1967, read, What We Want Now. 1. We want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our black community. 2. We want full employment for our people. 3. We want an end to the robbery by the white man of our black community. 4. We want decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings. 5. We want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in the present day society. 6. We want all black men to be exempt from military service. 7. 
We want an immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. 8. We want freedom for all black men held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and jails. 9. We want all black people when brought to trial to be tried in court by a jury of their peer group or people from their black communities as defined by the Constitution of the United States. 10. We want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. The Black Panthers elaborated on their 10-point program and the revolutionary politics that underlies it in an additional section entitled, What We Believe. To further their plan, the Black Panther Party instituted many programs within the community. Many familiar with the Black Panthers are aware of their police patrol. As Elbert Big Man Howard explains, So we would get in our cars and we would ride around and we'd see the police stop somebody. Uh, we would get out with our gun and stand at the legal distance and observe these so-called officers of the law in the performance of their duty. And of course, they didn't like that. <laughs> and then we would tell the person that's been accosted by the police, go ahead and take the arrest, don't resist, and uh, we're going to follow you down to the jail and we're gonna bail you out. While the Panthers were best known for their confrontations with police, they're less well known for their other community programs. By some accounts, there were over 200 of these survival programs that the Panthers administered. A small list of these programs included free breakfast for children, community health clinics, childcare, a program directly addressing sickle cell anemia, dental and optometry programs, pest control, a food program that gave out 5,000 bags of groceries per week, free clothing and shoes, and free transportation for prison visitations. Additionally, the Panthers instituted Seniors Against a Fearful Environment, or SAFE. Again, Howard explains. And that meant when uh, senior citizens got their checks on the uh, first of the month and needed to go to the doctor, needed to go to the bank or whatever, they were set upon by predators who take their money and abuse them. So we set up a program where we would drive them or escort them wherever they needed to go. And uh, with the Panthers uh, uh, guiding them or being with them, they were not set upon by anybody because they know that they had some problems coming that they did. <laughs> Like the ideology of civil rights that W.E.B. Du Bois put forward, and the ideology of separatism and self-determination that Booker T. Washington espoused, the Black Panther Party and its expression of revolutionary black nationalism came with its set of strengths and limitations. Many of its critics have denounced the Panthers as a criminal organization. That denunciation is a distortion of the truth. As a radical revolutionary organization, the Panthers reached out to all oppressed people, including gang members and incarcerated people. As part of an intentional outreach, the Black Panthers in Chicago, for example, attempted to forge a coalition with the Blackstone Rangers, a Chicago gang. Howard Saffold, who was then a member of Chicago's Afro-American Patrolmen's League, recalls. The Panthers were pursuing a, an ideology that said, we need to take these young minds, this young energy, and, and turn it into part of our movement in terms of black liberation and the rest of it. And, and I saw a very purposeful, intentional uh, effort on the part of the police department to keep that head from hooking up to that body. Because their vision of revolutionary nationalism embraced Marxist elements during a climate of intense Cold War anti-communism, the Black Panther Party found itself a target of a federal counterintelligence program, or COINTELPRO. COINTELPRO was an FBI program that ran between 1956 and 1971. Its purpose was to disrupt domestic political organizations deemed subversive to the United States government. In 1968, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover called the Panthers the greatest threat to the internal security of the country. To disrupt the organization and sow conflict between the Panthers and other groups, Hoover directed his field offices to exploit all avenues of creating further dissension and to submit regular reports on imaginative and hard-hitting counterintelligence measures aimed at crippling the Black Panther Party.
as part of that effort. FBI agents wrote an anonymous letter to Jeff Fort, the leader of the Blackstone Rangers, warning Fort that the Panthers have, quote, a hit out for you, unquote. The Bureau knew that the information was false, but believed that Fort might take retaliatory action against the Panthers. That the Black Panther Party deliberately reached out to the formerly incarcerated exposed them to another vulnerability. The Panthers recognized the difficulty that having a criminal record imposed on one's ability to gain employment or even find a place to live. As such, they deliberately sought to create meaningful space for ex-offenders in their many community service programs. Their doing so exposed the Panthers to a vulnerability in that ex-offenders and the formerly incarcerated are the very people most susceptible to police coercion. Former FBI informant William O'Neill recalls. My recruitment by the FBI was very efficient, very simple, really. Um, I'd stolen a car and uh, went joyriding over the state limit. And um, they had a potential case against me, and I was looking for an opportunity to uh, work it off. And um, a couple of months later, that opportunity came when uh, uh, FBI agent Roy Mitchell asked me to uh, go down to the local office of the Black Panther Party and try to uh, gain membership. The Black Panther Party took a revolutionary black nationalist platform and applied it to a comprehensive, creative, and energetic program. They were committed to learning from global anti-colonial movements and applying those principles at the community level. Nevertheless, their vulnerabilities combined with state repression led to internal friction and a culture of mistrust that eroded the organization from the inside out. As a result, the Black Panther Party officially disbanded in 1982. What lessons can we learn from those vulnerabilities? Could the demise of the Black Panther Party have been avoided? Please share your thoughts in the comments below. I'm Darius Spearman, and if you're still with me, do consider joining the history makers in our Patreon community who make it possible for me to continue to make this content in black history. Thank you so much for your support. If you'd like to become a history maker, you can join them for as little as a dollar a month. Otherwise, thank you for watching, and until next time, I'll see you in the comments.